He's just an example for us of how to live well. But he's just an example, right? We don't really stand in need of a Savior. Okay, but that's a heresy, right? St. Paul says that we were all born children of wrath. In, in the example that I gave, that sort of image of, of the child who grows up with all the natural things that it needs, but without love, without communication, right? that child will, will likely be, uh, you won't want to be its friend, probably. Right? It's kind of an example that original sin is something that God needed to take care of, and he did. He did. He put in a plan to redeem us. Right? And we call this plan Revelation. Right? Revelation. Right? So what, what is happening in Revelation? What's God trying to do? Salvation. He's trying to say, right from the beginning, even in the Old Testament, right? even in the Old Testament, He puts in a plan for salvation. Right? And we were marching through that. We got all the way through. I'm pretty sure we, I left off with David, but then I remembered that we didn't talk about um, Joshua, right? So I think we sort of left off with Moses. Right? And this story of salvation, right? We're kind of flying through a lot of history really fast. But I, I want us to just go through this, to march through this so you can just get a flavor Right, for, for the Old Testament, for the story of salvation. Right, I mean, tonight we're going to go from, from Joshua all the way to Jesus. Okay, and that's, that's like 2,000 years right there. Okay, so we're, we're marching fast, but this is um, revelation. We want to get a feel, a feel for how God revealed himself. Okay? Now, of course, who, the history of salvation began with who? Who did God prom make promises to? Abram. Abram, right? How many? The threefold promise, right? The threefold promise. Um, I think it's. Right. Right, the promises of, of a nation, <clears throat> which means people and land, a name, right? God promised Abram. At that, that point, Abraham, that he would have a son, right, and have, have a name, and then a universal blessing, right, and God established a covenant with, with Abraham, and these were, these were fulfilled, the first one in the Mosaic covenant, that's where we're at today, and then we'll get to the Davidic covenant and the new covenant, okay? Now, Joshua, right, he is the one who arrives in the promised land, right? The story of, of the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian captivity, the exile. Like the Israelites uh, leave under Moses, but Moses never sees the promised land, right? He sort of dies in the promised lands in the distance. And it's Joshua, Joshua, Moses' successor, who brings them, brings them to the promised land. And it's, it's not... It's not too pretty. It's a bit bloody as they, as they reach the promised land, right? But this is very important because this was part of the promise. This was part of the promise God made to, to Abraham, right? He told Abraham that they would be in slavery. And then he told them they would have a land of their own, right? The promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, good? And once they reach the promised land, right, it's divided up into the 12 tribes, um, now, as they establish themselves in the promised land, right, first they had to sort of move out all the people that were there, right, all the other religions, right, the Canaanites, and they, they established themselves there without a king, without a king. And that was a big, a big deal because everyone else had a king. All the neighboring tribes and cultures or it had a king, but the Israelites had the Lord as their king, right? the Lord God. 
And instead of a king, what did they have? They had judges. Right? The judges who were more like uh, military rulers. Uh, there's about 17 judges. Right? And you, some of the stories you probably know. Um, my favorite story in the Bible is the story of Samson. I just love that one. My mom like read that one to me when I was like, you know, four or five. And, Man, it's so cool. I just want to be Samson, you know. And uh, and, and there's, some, there's some other great stories in the judge in the in the period of of the judges, right? And you know when Israel is unfaithful to the covenant, right? Bad things happen, right? Almost almost instantly, right? Because they're in this they're in this spot where they are aware, they're deeply aware that God had, had spoken to them, that they were the chosen people, that God had asked them to be faithful. Right? The first commandment, you shall have no other gods. I am the Lord your God. Right? But they failed, and they, and they were unfaithful at times, and as soon as they do that, usually some neighboring tribe comes in and starts you know, killing them and instantly and they turn back and they're faithful, right? And I know you, you probably heard this story a lot, but it is true. It's this back and forth of faithfulness and unfaithfulness for the Israelites. And finally they reach uh, the judge Samuel, right? Um, ah, well, yeah, well, of course, it's also important that the, the, the judges are appointed by God. Right, God, who is supposed to be their king, they're supposed to know their king, but he appoints the judges. Right, but we reach finally Samuel, who is um, a judge, but at the same time a prophet. And his sons are, should take over his job. But they, they have already proved themselves unfaithful. And so the Israelites finally want a king for their own. Right, everyone else has a king, and they demand from God. And this was, this was a big deal because God was supposed to be their king. And yet here they, they're, uh, they're demanding Samuel. Samuel asked the Lord that we can have a king. And, and the amazing thing is that, is that God, He grants them a king. He does. Even though He was supposed to be their king, He, he grants them a king. Right? And it's, it's, it's first Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. But the most famous king right, is, is King David. Right? I'm sure you know a few stories about King David. David, who was a ruddy and handsome youth, right? the youngest son, the one who stuck his hand in the satchel and slung stone and killed right Goliath. And that's David. And David was uh, you know a king after God's own heart. Right? And with David, remember David wasn't even supposed to exist as king. But God grants it. And <clears throat> with David God makes a covenant. Right? So God shows himself to be extra generous right, in, in the history of salvation. Right? Israel asks for a king, he gives him a king, and then he not only does that, he gives the king a covenant. I will make for you a great name. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Right? This is probably the most important Old Testament prophecy that we have. Why is that? What's the most important word in this prophecy? What was that? This was the covenant. Covenant? I'm talking about the, the, the text. So I'll make for you a great name. Son. 
All right, oh, that's a pretty important one. Son, I will be his father and he shall be my son. All right, so there's somebody coming who's going to be a son for forever. Forever. He shall build a house for a name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Or, I mean, this is, this is not just any prophecy. Right? This is the one, right, that's, you can almost overlook that little phrase, forever, God is promising an eternal kingdom, an eternal throne. And God is true to his, his promises, right? This is the great prophecy of, of course, Jesus, who is the son, who has a throne that the kingdom that shall last. Forever. And that's where we want to be one day in his, in his kingdom. Okay? Now, a few things happen though between David and Jesus, right? Like a thousand years happen. This is about a year a thousand. Okay? We got a little time yet. Right? But again, uh, the name promised to, to Abraham is fulfilled in the Davidic covenant. Okay? I will establish a, a royal dynasty, a name. Okay? So it, it harkens back to the first. Uh, first covenant of Abraham. Okay, so we have Father Shower spoke about this quite a bit in the night when we had our little church tour, right? Uh, King Solomon, the son of David, builds builds a temple, right? And it's in Jerusalem, right? It's, it's the holiest place in, in Israel. That's where they go to worship, the place of worship. Okay? Uh, again, though you have the, the neighboring tribes, which are always causing trouble, the neighboring cultures, right? And there's a split in Israel itself, right? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The ten tribes rebel. They form the northern kingdom, right? Their, their headquarters uh, is, uh, I think, Shechem, right there, little star. And then... Judah and Benjamin are the two southern tribes, and right? they're headquartered in Jerusalem. Okay, so this happens in 722. All right, both kingdoms are continually rebelling, and then God starts to send the prophets, right, to to get them to repent. All right, the prophets who uh, really some of the most interesting figures in the Bible. If you just want to pick up an Old Testament book and read it, I suggest Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. I mean, they're all good, but that's that one especially. Okay. Right. The prophets speak not only uh, words of uh, you know repentance and, and come back to the Lord, but also they prophesy. Right? They speak of the Messiah, right? the one who will come, right? who will finally fulfill the covenant. There's still that third blessing that hasn't been fulfilled yet, right? To Abraham, which was a universal blessing, right? Um, was it? I can't remember the exact words right now, but God promised Abraham that like, all nations, right, will be, um, will be in your covenant. Okay? All right, so this is the, the era of the prophets, right? Until we get to the year 587, Jerusalem is conquered by Babylon and the temple is destroyed. Right? The temple is destroyed. And Jeremiah spoke a lot about this. I mean, he kept saying, we're going to go to exile. The Babylonians are going to come. And this is because you were unfaithful. Right? You must submit to this, this punishment by God. And it did happen. Right? The temple was destroyed. It was, this is a real historical event, right? Um, Jerusalem is conquered by the Babylonians. They go into exile. Okay. Remember when I was talking about creation and the this, this six-day story of creation? Right? The, the origins of that story, that comes when the Israelites come into contact with the Babylonians. The Babylonians got all these crazy stories about how the, the world was, was created. Right? And the Israelites, now at this point, right, they come into contact with these other cultures and it gets them to reflect. 
to think about uh, the story of, of creation and, and helps them um, better put forth the meaning, the meaning of creation. Right? So that's just, I know something we talked about before, but I want to just bring us back to that, right? Because the Old Testament, right, you have two things happen. You have all these historical events, right, these, these historical events, but then you have the scriptures themselves, which are sort of right, lagging behind, if you will. Right? It's not immediately put down on paper, the events, but it's sort of lagging behind. And even the, the stories of creation, all that, take place not at the moment. Okay? So, Jews are exiled to Babylon, and they're tempted to assimilate, right? To, to leave behind their religion. Right? This is where you have Daniel, right? Daniel in the lion's den. Right? Here he is. Right? He, right? They're wondering why he's being faithful to all these rules that God had given him. Right? After all, they're in exile. It should be time to rebel against God. Right? Things aren't going well for you. Why are you still faithful? But um, Daniel is faithful. That upsets the king of Babylon. He throws him down a bunch of lions. Right? But God spares him. So puts a trap in the lion's mouth. Daniel makes it out. Right? Another classic Bible story. That's right? Daniel. Okay? So there's still... In, but while they're in Babylon, I think they commit themselves to the covenant. This is the great purification of Israel. Right? There we sat in Babylon and we wept. Right? We wept. But they, they stayed faithful. And it purified them. It, 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 they had to be faithful there. Right? Because it was, it was either you're, you're kind of in or out. Right? In, in exile. So they commit themselves again to the covenant. Okay? And then God helps them out a little bit. He gets another um, kingdom to take the Babylonians out of power. And those are the Persians. Like King Cyrus. And then it sort of works out for the Israelites because all of a sudden they can go back, they can go back to their promised land. Okay? Babylon's conquered by Persia. And King Cyrus is God's chosen instrument to let the Israelites go back to the promised land. Okay. Everyone tracking? We're, we're doing good. It's like 500 years. Moving right through it, all right? Okay. Just sit down and read the whole Bible one day and you'll get it. you get it all. All right. So, they got to rebuild the temple, though, right? So they do. They rebuild the temple. Then Father Shires talked about this, too. The second temple. Right? After Ezra and Nehemiah. I was, I was thinking about these prophets when we were building this this building because <laughs> they have some some great stuff just about um, building building buildings and lots of neat things in, in these two prophets right but they rebuild the temple right things are going great but this guy comes along named Alexander Hamilton no, I'm kidding, not Alexander. <laughs> Alexander the Great <laughs> Alexander the Great <laughs> right he is the tremendous conqueror right he extends right, the, the Greek uh, language and culture all across the known world, right? and he conquers um, uh, the, the Israel as well, right? the Jerusalem. Okay? But uh, there's these, God raises up these brave men, right? the Israelites who are going to fight back against the Greeks. And the Greeks had come into the temple and profaned it. And uh, you know, uh, replaced, uh, took all of the holy things and replaced it with their own worship, right? And and the Maccabees are sort of the, the rebellious Jews, right? They're going to fight to get their temple back. And so Matthias Maccabee and his sons, right? He's, he's got seven sons, and they overthrow the Greek cellular empire. Okay, um, very very brave and famous stories in the book of Maccabees. Okay? But finally, the Maccabees who had allied themselves with the Roman Empire towards the end here, they get the Romans to help them out. That sort of backfires on them. Because in the year 63 B.C., 
the Romans siege Jerusalem. Okay. We're getting, we're getting close to Christ now. We're all the way up to 63 BC. Right? The Romans, uh, they, they siege and take over Jerusalem. And even today, if you go to Rome, you can see uh, the, the memory of this event. Uh, I don't know if it's this one, but there is some artifacts in the Roman Forum which chronicle this event. It shows the Romans taking the various Jewish um, liturgical elements like the menorah, right? the, the uh, sort of the candlestick, or the curved candlestick. Right? The Romans are like, all right, this is what Romans do. Right? They go conquer some place, they take what they like, and they bring it to Rome, and they put it out. Right? If you go to Rome today, you can see the obelisks from Egypt. And, uh, that's what the Romans love to do. They love to take things and bring them back to Rome and sort of show their, their power. Right? Show that, that they were uh, they were in charge. Okay? Um, and this leads us to think about well the time really the time of Christ, right? Uh, at this point this is a very important event because the Roman Empire taking over, right, at least politically taking over Jerusalem means what? When Jesus is born, he's born in the Roman Empire. Right? He's born in a place where the Romans are in shock. Right? And the language is Greek. That language is, is spoken everywhere because of Alexander the Great, and from, from what is now like Scotland all the way to Iraq. And there's Roman roads, and amazing roads. You still see them today. And all of this was in place when the time was fulfilled, when God decided to come in the flesh. And this was, this was very important. This was the preparation right, for, for, for that event, the incarnation. Okay? That's a lot of salvation history pretty fast. Any questions? Any, anything? What happens next? We'll get there. Okay. All right. Awesome. Alright, so, how are we doing here with God's threefold promise? Right, Steve's got a question. Yeah. I was curious, when does the Ark of the Covenant disappear in salvation history? Mm. Do you happen, happen to know offhand? I don't at the moment. Um, yeah. Right? It, it's in the temple. It's in the Holy of Holies. Uh, the temple <coughs> is destroyed. 587. They take the. At that point, yeah, does, it, does it go to the Babylonian exile and such? Yeah, I don't know. What charge do you know? Not sure. Yeah, it's a good so question. The lines around that, if it's in the Second Chronicles, around the time of the Babylonian exile, is when it's last that issue recorded. That last time we saw it. All right, so if you find it, let me know. <laughs> All right. All right. So again, back to back to God's first movement in salvation history to Abraham. Right. Right. God says He promises Him a nation, a name, and a universal blessing, and He's fulfilled those first two. What remains is the universal blessing. This happens in the person. Of Jesus Christ, okay? God's blessing extends to all nations through Him. Right. So all these stories, right? All of these uh, events, which seem kind of like messy history, right? These are the words of sacred Scripture, but they are the word of God. Right. God speaks only one single word, His one utterance, in whom He expresses Himself completely. 
all sacred scriptures but one book. And this one book is Christ. Because all divine scripture speaks of Christ. All divine scripture is fulfilled in Christ. Right? And we know this because Jesus himself right, speaks so often of the Old Testament. He right? quotes uh, the Old Testament stories. It has obviously a deep knowledge of, of the Old Testament. Right? Sees himself as the Messiah. And so we read the Old Testament really through the new. Right? We, we, we read all the stories right, through the event of Jesus Christ. And we see in those stories right, God bringing us along, right? bringing the, the Israelites toward this, this supreme moment. Right? So all the, right, the prophecies, all of these uh, these images in the Old Testament now take on a new new light right, in God's final word. Right? His final word. There's nothing left to say. Right? The Lord has spoken His, His final word, which is Jesus. Okay? But to end, I just want to have a little discussion about, about Jesus. Do we believe Jesus is God? He said so. He said so. He wasn't, you know, he didn't really say it like that all the time, right? He did oftentimes in veiled ways. Right? But he did say it, right? So that's a good reason. I mean, he himself said it, right? But I imagine there might be other people in the history of the world who said they were God. I don't, I mean, I can't think of one right now, but I bet there was. Maybe you did when you were five. Augustus. <laughs> I got, yeah. He was, the, 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 the Egyptians thought their, their Pharaoh was like the son of God, too. Like the son of God is a pretty common term in the ancient world. All right, so what's the deal? Jesus is God. Why? How? The miracles he performed? Yeah, just the miracles. The resurrection. <clears throat> there you go. The resurrection. The shroud yeah. of turn. What's that? The shroud of turn. The shroud of turn. That's pretty good. Yeah. Good proof. The resurrection. That's, that's it. I mean, Jesus is alive. He died a real death. He rose from the dead, right? Even his miracles, well, um, there's some miracles in the Old Testament, you know, there's, that's, I don't know if that, right, it doesn't quite get us there. You mean like that? What's that? You mean that Jesus, like, uh, brought people, brought the terrorists back to the dead? Sure, yeah, yeah. 